This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The U.S.-led coalition in Afghanistan officially concluded its combat mission on Sunday, 13 years after it started in 2001, ending the longest war in U.S. history. The commander of the International Security Assistance Force, or uh, ISAF, General John Campbell, announced the end of formal combat operations. Today marks the end of an era, the beginning of a new one. Today, NATO completes its combat mission, a 13-year endeavor filled with significant achievements and branded by tremendous sacrifice, especially by the thousands of coalition and Afghan army and police wounded and fallen who gave so much to build a brighter future for this war-torn land. But the war is not over. The Obama administration said earlier this month it would leave a residual U.S. force of about 11,000 troops in Afghanistan for at least the first months of 2015 to assist Afghan security forces under the mission known as Resolute Support. And last month, President Obama secretly extended the U.S. role in Afghanistan. According to The New York Times, he signed a classified order that ensures American troops will have a direct role in fighting. The order reportedly enables American jets, bombers and drones to bolster Afghan troops on combat missions. Under certain circumstances, it would apparently authorize U.S. airstrikes to support Afghan military operations throughout the country. Afghanistan's new president, Ashraf Ghani, who took office in September, has also backed an expanded U.S. military role. This comes as 2014 marked the deadliest in Afghanistan since 2001. The United Nations reports nearly 3,200 Afghan civilians were killed in the intensifying war with the Taliban, a 20 percent rise from 2013. The National Army and police also suffered record losses this year, with more than 4,600 killed. For more, we're joined by two guests. Kathy Kelly is with us in studio, co-coordinator of Voices for Creative Nonviolence, a campaign to end U.S. military and economic warfare. She returned from Kabul last month and is heading soon to prison be over a drone protest in Missouri. She recently wrote an article headlined, Obama extends war in Afghanistan. The implications for U.S. democracy aren't reassuring. And Matt Aikens also joins us, a journalist based in Kabul. He's joining us from Halifax, Nova Scotia, in Canada. Aikens is currently a Shell Fellow at the Nation Institute. His recent report for Rolling Stone magazine is headlined, Afghanistan, the Making of a Narco State. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Kathy Kelly, you were just in Afghanistan. What is the significance of saying the formal war is over, but in fact the formal uh, war continues with U.S. troops fighting? Well, I think the United States doesn't want to acknowledge that what went on over the last 13 years at a cost of $1 trillion has been not only a defeat, but as one British commentator said, also a disgrace. I mean, the extent of spending $80 billion under the Obama administration that fueled corruption, that uh, did not improve the lives of people in Afghanistan in any measurable way, uh, ought never, ever to be, be held up as some kind of a success story. But I think the United States wants to walk away from responsibilities within Afghanistan, certainly doesn't talk about paying reparations. Matt Aikens, talk about officially what this means. You have lived in Afghanistan for a long time covering it. How is the scene in Afghanistan? Well, the scene in Afghanistan really isn't going to change uh, today. The war continues by any measure. You have 11,000 U.S. troops with co new combat authorities. You have rising levels of violence. You have the highest ever casualties, both for the Afghan security forces and civilians. So in no sense um, but the semantic can this war be said to be over. And if we have the end of the formal end of a war, that means the beginning of an informal war, which is troubling indeed, as Kathy says. Uh, on Thursday, President Obama addressed troops gathered for Christmas dinner at a Marine Corps base in Hawaii. He spoke about the end of the U.S. combat mission in Afghanistan. We've been in continuous war now for almost 13 years, over 13 years. And, uh, and next week, uh, we will be ending our combat mission in Afghanistan. Obviously, because of the extraordinary service of the men and women uh, in the American armed, uh, armed Forces, Afghanistan has a chance to rebuild its own country. Uh, we are safer. It's not going to be a, a source of terrorist attacks again. And 
We still have some very difficult missions around the world, including in Iraq. We still have folks in Afghanistan helping Afghan security forces. The outgoing um, uh, defense secretary, uh, Chuck Hagel, uh, spoke earlier this month talking about um, uh, the United States uh, keeping an additional 1,000 troops in Afghanistan, on top of the nearly 10,000 already committed to remain beyond this year. Um, he announced the move during a visit to Afghanistan. President Obama has provided U.S. military commanders the flexibility, the flexibility to manage any temporary four shortfalls that we might experience for a few months as we allow for coalition troops to arrive in theater. This will mean a delayed withdrawal of up to 1,000 U.S. troops, so that up to 10,800 troops, rather than 9,800, could remain in Afghanistan through the end of this year and for the first few months next year. Now, Hagel said the change is temporary and won't change the long-term timeline for withdrawing troops. The announcement came amidst a surge in Taliban attacks over the past several months. And uh, the new president of Afghanistan, uh, Ashraf Ghani, Kathy Kelly, um, has lifted a former President Karzai's ban on night raids. The significance of this? Well, using the night raids, which is— uh, their means of surprising the Taliban by bursting into homes at 3.30 in the morning, by arresting people, um, possibly disappearing them over a period of months or possibly longer, is, is a despised tactic. It's, it's a way, many say, to recruit more people to either tolerate or support the Taliban. But the, uh, the decision on the part of Ashraf Ghani shows a willingness to continue cooperating with the corruption of the U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. He, I think, has tried to make some changes, uh, for instance, in going after corrupt figures within the Kabul Bank. But uh, why is why is he so reluctant to disobey any orders from the United States or disobey the desires of the United States? Well, I think we we see that um, even Britain now is saying that they had um, seen themselves as being in a subordinate role to the United States, and now look back with a great deal of remorse on, on the disgrace that the war has brought on Britain. Matt Akins, what has been the result of this war? We won't say with its end, uh, but at this uh, sort of point, 13 years in, what has been the effect on Afghanistan? Well, getting back to the last point about um, President Hani's cooperation with the U.S. military, um, one of the results has been an extremely dependent state, perhaps the most aid-dependent um, large state uh, in history. And so the Afghan government can't possibly pay for um, its budget expenditures. It can't pay for the overlarge uh, army and police force that we've created for it. It's billions of dollars um, in excess of its revenues. So there really is no choice, I think President Ghani recognizes that, but to cooperate with with the U.S. military, um, because the government would collapse very swiftly if, if international support were withdrawn. On a number of other um, indicators, you have mixed results. In, in the cities and places like Kabul, there's been significant development. Uh, education has been a success story. But if you travel outside of, of the capital, which increasingly should do because of the rising insecurity, you'll find that there's things like child malnutrition, food insecurity, uh, growing opium production, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, I guess, and um, just an increased level of violence and insecurity that paints a very stark divide between the urban and rural uh, parts of the country. And what about women's rights, Matt? Women, women's rights have made um, a lot of gains in, in urban areas, places like Kabul, um, especially symbolic ones. But the fact of the matter is, is that in rural areas, particularly ones afflicted by insecurity uh, in the South, there hasn't been a lot of change. In any case, this change isn't going to come at the barrel of a gun. It's not going to come in conditions of insecurity. The question now is whether the gains that have been made in urban areas are going to be rolled back, if, there, if there's going to be not just for women's rights, but for things like free speech, for things like the rule of law, corruption, human rights abuses by the Afghan security forces, whether these are going to be areas where we're going to see, um, you know, a retreat in progress, uh, especially as the mission there becomes one that's primarily focused on counterterrorism and military goals. So there needs to be pressure, not just from the administration, but for all voices on Afghanistan to make sure that those, those hard-fought gains um, 
games that were hard fought, not just by the internationals, but mostly by, by the Afghan people themselves, aren't uh, lost. The significance of the Pakistani military um, and the role it plays now uh, in Afghanistan after the army public school massacre by the Taliban earlier this month in Peshawar, the Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif pledged solidarity with his Afghan neighbor in fighting terrorism. The attack in Peshawar killed 152 people, including 133 children. Pakistan up in territory, man. Pakistan will not tolerate these militant elements on its territory. If our territory is used for any activities against Afghanistan, we will deal with it very strongly and will take tough action against those elements. In the same way, if anything like this happens on the Afghan side, they will also deal with it in a strong manner. After General Rahil's visit to Kabul, they've carried out an operation in the region. Matt Aiken, if you can talk about the effect, what's going to happen with the Pakistani military's relationship in Afghanistan with the military and with the Taliban? Well, you have to remember that we've seen this kind of rhetoric from the government before after similar uh, shocking incidents. There was an attack in 2011 against the uh, Pakistani naval base in Karachi by the Taliban, an attack against the general headquarters in 2009. Uh, there was the whole incident of the Lal Masjid scene. Uh, siege in, in 2007, the assassination of Benazir Bhutto. And after, you know, each one of these sort of watershed um, so-called moments, you've seen the same kind of rhetoric that there's no more, there's going to be no more distinction between good and bad Taliban. We're going to go after their sanctuaries in the tribal areas. We're not going to support militants uh, in Afghanistan. But the fact of the matter is, is that the relationship, uh, the complex relationship between the Pakistani state and various militant groups are tied to much deeper strategic and structural interests of the military, uh, of, of the of Pakistani's, you know, central government. Um, so it, it remains to be seen whether this actually represents some sort of fundamental shift. Uh, and certainly one incident isn't going to isn't going to solve that. There's been plenty of massacres in Pakistan of children of, 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 of innocence. And that's this is not going to change um, their calculations all of a sudden.